400G networks, I guess, where are we right now in terms of the technologies that are available to make it happen? Can, can you give us a sort of overview of that? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. So 400G was um, even as, as near as, say, you know, nine months ago, it was the NASA technology that was going to take off here in 2020. And a couple of reasons for that is um, there's a new round of or a new um, level of um, optical um, modulation, if you will, PAM4 modulation have been really started to roundly be adopted to allow um, higher mo modulation, better encoding to be able to, sh to um, send more data down the, down the light stream. And switches are being introduced into the market. So optical switches, optical routers uh, from the big uh, NEMS manufacturers that allow for, um, you know, basically for it to happen, right? Uh, without those switches in the market, you know, you couldn't have 400G. Now those switches are being introduced here in 2020, but as we all know, we've got a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, a speed bump, if you will, in uh, how things are being adopted. And, you know, a lot of, um, you know, enterprises and perhaps service providers were looking at, you know, ways to, you know, maybe not, not no longer in their plans to deploy, but I think, you know, at the data center level, at say a hyperscale content, you know, I think that's really starting to be, you know, I think it's really starting to be a real, um, you know, prominent technology. I don't know, John, what, you have any different thoughts on that topic? No, I, I think you nailed it, Ray. The, the pandemic has certainly affected uh, deployment plans across, I think, service providers in particular in that uh, lab environments and some of the testing that would, would be done has, has been very difficult this year. And service providers have been um, racing to add capacity to their networks. And in many cases, the easiest path was adding more 10 or more 100 gig interfaces to, to the existing backplane. So I think 400 gig took a little bit of a, a backseat for service providers in particular but the technology continues to evolve. So full suite of DACs and AOCs have hit the marketplace and, and certainly we're offering as well as transceivers. You, you nailed it. The, the, the hyperscale data centers have to do these upgrades. You know, 40 and 100 gig links are, are becoming saturated. The amount of video and teleconferencing that's happening right now because of the pandemic uh, that's driving that service provider upgrade is, is even more real inside of the data center where you're replicating these video streams, you know, like the very one we're recording now um, is consuming just tremendous amounts of bandwidth. So 400 gig was, I, I think, certainly got derailed a bit in 2020, but we're seeing an uptick in the data center now. And I think, you know, going into 2021, we're gonna see large scale SP uh, transport network upgrades. Okay, and in terms of the actual sort of infrastructure investment required, I mean, just thinking about the sort of 4G to 5G transition, one of the major stumbling blocks seems to be the fact that you've got to put in a whole new set of infrastructure. You can't simply upgrade from 4 to 5G without putting a load in your kit. What's the situation from sort of 100G to 400G? Is there a similar sort of forklift upgrade required or, or can you easily migrate from 100 up to the 400? I, I think the, the fact is, most of the upgrades for 400 gig are new devices. So whether it's a new chassis with new line cards or a new pizza box or standalone switch, you know, the, the major equipment manufacturers that were shipping last year weren't by and large shipping 400 gig interfaces. So we're seeing, you know, significant for chassis based devices, significant upgrades either in the management cards or the fabric interconnect cards. Certainly the line card itself is an upgrade. I think what, what's really interesting, and, and Ray can probably speak to this, is you know, 400 gig has some really nice um, breakout options. So the ability for service providers to, or data centers to reuse those 100 gig interfaces that they've already invested in with a new transceiver um, and use aggregate or breakout um, from new 400 gig cores. So you know, really natural hand-me-down, put 400 gig in the core of the network, push that investment, that 100 gig investment down one notch into the aggregation or access layer. And, and Ray, you want to talk a little bit about the 400 gig FR? Um, oh, abs or 100 gig yeah. FR. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, John, the um, you know, 400 gig is just not going to appear in the cabinet tomorrow. It's going to, it's going to grow from the core 
you know, and work its way out there like a, some giant blob or something like that. Anyway, um, you'll start out with 400 gig in a, in a, you know, in the core, and you'll break it out to um, 100 gig connections. Now, the interesting thing about about 400 gig that a lot of um, data centers, in particular, right now, are understanding is that if you have a, you know, 400 gig, you know, breakout transceiver, which breaks out to four 100 gig um, uh, connections, if you will, you know, those are not going to be 100% interoperable with some of the uh, transceivers they're going to have installed in their current network. The previous generation of transceivers use an NRZ, non-return to zero um, formatting, whereas the 400 gig transceivers use the PAM4 uh, modulation, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a whole host of new transceivers being introduced, which are actually single wavelengths. So one by 100 transceivers that have that PAM4 modulation that now are allowing that aggregation of multiple 100 gig streams back to a 400 gig port. So it's a four by 100 breakout um, using that PAM4. And then on the, these transceivers actually have a you know, bit of a gearbox inside. So that gearbox allows them to do that PAM4 to NRZ conversion inside the transceiver. And that way, you know, your legacy switches, as John mentioned, uh, you know, they can be used in your legacy switches. So that's a really interesting thing that we're, we're finding here in this 400 gig is this, this notion of everything just kind of flowing back upstream to um, really aggregating at that 400 gig port. And in terms of what end users, I mean, if you can summarize maybe what end users have to understand in the, the planning to upgrade to 400G, that would be useful. And also maybe um, as a supplementary data center design, yeah, I think you've alluded obviously to some of the issues, but I'm wondering what other changes might be required. I mean, is it multi-mode to single fibers, you know, one possible, I mean, can you give us some of that landscape and maybe start with Ray? Okay. Yeah, great. You know, one thing you, you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, one of the big transitions we are seeing is a transition from multi-mode to single mode fiber in the data center. A uh, single mode fiber really represents, uh, you know, at this point, we still don't know what the limitations are going to be in single mode fiber. Whereas a multi-mode fiber, we're very aware now what, what the limitations are. So uh, being able to go to a, a duplex fiber for your 400 gig and 100 gig connections, even in a short, shorter, short, shorter reach scenario is uh, really what the data center operators are looking for. They're looking for that level of simplicity. Whereas with starting with the 40 gig, 100 gig, especially now 400 gig, you, know, you need to use the MPO connector, different multi-fiber patch cables, all sorts of things that bring new complexities into the data center design. So that's probably one of the big th things that you know we're seeing. I don't know, John, if if uh, um, some of the things you've seen. Yeah, I think the the single mode transition is probably one of the largest impacting. So you've got you know data centers that have been built over the last many years with with structured multi-mode cabling infrastructure. And so the idea that uh, to go 400 gig and beyond, you know, we're really looking at, at, at single mode options to, to kind of stretch the capabilities of, of the transport layer is, is huge. We, we underestimate the, the cost and complexity of upgrading cabling infrastructure inside of a data center. It's, it's quite a bit more time consuming and involved and risky than replacing even routers and switches or, or transceivers. And so I think you know, Ray highlights that um, that point really clearly. I think the other the other piece as we we think about 400 gig is um, as bit rates continue to increase, both at the the server layer in a in a hyperscale data center, all the way up through the aggregation layer and, and into the, the core switching fabric, is thermal concerns. So these 400 gig routers are getting denser and denser. Uh, the transceivers aren't getting larger, but they are getting higher bit rate and higher power and higher power equals higher heat dissipation. And so the idea that, you know, we face this with, with virtualization and, and high end compute where, you know, racks were, were designed for a kilowatt and then three kilowatts and now six kilowatts. Um, I think we're going to see racks need to scale way beyond that in terms of you know, thermal capabilities to, to accommodate what will be 400 gig in mass and in volume uh, in the near future. So I would suggest the data centers have a couple of challenges ahead of them with 400 gig. 
I just, I mean, it just occurs to me, it might be a, a stupid <clears> question, but I mean, the, the high performance compute guys are looking seriously at liquid cooling, you know, within the server at the chip level. I mean, is it conceivable at some stage in the future that liquid cooling for network switches or other network components, or is that just a sort of a nonsense? I mean, to, you know, the, I've, I've, I've spent my entire career in, in, in service provider. We've, we've talked about the idea of a, a liquid cooled um, or, or any type of alternative cooled uh, router or switch, or even transport. I think the, the economics of it are still a bit prohibitive. So, you know, and, and there's some risk if you have these large cooling loops, you know, we've, we see, we see liquid cooling loops today for HVAC systems and the challenges with keeping water inside the pipes. I think that's that's probably the biggest challenge. And now you talk about extending that same liquid cooled infrastructure all the way into the rack and the ability to circulate that liquid um, successfully without a spill or without seepage, I think becomes a bit challenging. So now, you know, you've got a network element that that might have a power connector or or many power connectors. You have a network element that's got lots and lots of fiber connectors for its interface, and now potentially um, a liquid connector to connect it into a, a centralized cooling loop. So just putting liquid inside the box doesn't really cool it. You need that liquid to circulate outside the box through a cooling loop and back to get real benefit of scale. And so now you've, you, you've got to plumb in your network elements and plumb in your servers just as you, as you would from a network and power. And so I, I, I see some challenges there. I, you know, Liquid and electronics have never gotten along too well. Um, so the, the the more liquid you put in and around them, I think the more risk comes with that. Uh, to your point, though, it, it also comes with scale and the ability to to dissipate heat, you know, in in such a way that air just can't do it. Uh, Ray, you have thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, this uh, notion of liquid cooling in the rack is it's been around for a while and goes back to you know, at least to do it with mainframes, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, mainframes weren't inherently scalable as our, you know, our modular computing that we currently look at with, with switching and servers and whatnot. So there are some fundamental differences there. But I think at the end of the day, it's gonna come down to economics. Is it gonna be cheap enough to do it or not? That's generally what everything comes boils down to, but that's just my my uh, view on it. Okay, and I mean, uh I guess a neat segue there, um, economics. So in terms of the actual people using 4G, 400G, sorry, now or early adopters in the future, um, I guess there aren't that many applications maybe that need it at the moment, but but where are they? The hyperscalers, the telcos, how do, how do you see the, the sort of current uh, market, I say? Yeah, absolutely. So um, right now you're really seeing it, you know, in this um, pandemic world, right? It's in the content. So it's in your video content providers, your internet content providers, everywhere where right now your, um, you know, your cloud providers are providing us this wonderful cloud platform that we can communicate across the continents with, right? These are the folks who are seeing the, the you know, they're the folks who are really deploying 400G right now. They're folks who need it. And there's other folks who do need it too, who is, we, we touched at the first part of the, uh, the first question is the telcos and service providers you know, their networks, their network cores are really feeling it, right? Because now they're the next step, right? You get towards the customer, it's all kind of rolling back up. And, you know, they need to increase the capacity of their core due to the, this rush of bandwidth coming their way. So I think, you know, that's kind of in step in order, right? That's your, your bottlenecks. If you think of the content as the core, right? Yep. Work your way out from the core. And, and, and I think Ray's point is valid that the service providers, you know, inside of a data center, you, you've you got, we talked about the challenges with fiber infrastructure. When you look at a service provider with a nationwide or regional or metro backbone, the optical networks that these service providers operate on have historically been, you know, dense wave division multiplex gridded. So 50 gigahertz or 100 gigahertz grid. The, the challenge will be that these native 400 gig interfaces when transponded onto a, a DWDM network don't fit on a 50 gigahertz gridded network and only in some cases fit in a 100 gigahertz gridded network. So 
for the service provider in the metro and regional and back, you know national backbone area, um, they've got a significant upgrade to do on their Rotom technology and the passive muxes that that feed into those Rotoms. Um, in some cases, the optical amplification, uh, you know, will need to be upgraded from EDFA to Raman or to higher end EDFAs or higher performance EDFAs to get these wideband 400 gig uh, lambdas through through transport networks. So, you know, not to not to think about the complexities of just 400 gig itself, but now getting 400 gig across longer distances is even more challenging. So we saw that with 100 gig, and and we're just now seeing 80 kilometer and longer 100 gig native uh, links and. And so 400 gig presents those same challenges that 100 gig presented a couple of years ago. Um, so not to, not to forget about the SPs and their transport network upgrades that it's, it's not all router, router to router or switch to switch. And I mean, longer term, the, the, you know, the, clearly we're already in the, the sort of digital age, but on sort of intelligent automation as the catch all, but under that IOT, um, all the different sort of activities that are going on with that. Will that drive, I guess, our autonomous vehicles are everyone's favorite example of, you know, vast amount of data needed in real time, et cetera. And the growth of that edge type application as well, um, without trying to com confuse with all those different bits, but how do you see the, um, the need for 400G, I guess, growing as you know, AI grows, is that right? So I think it depends on the type of AI. So when we think about connected refrigerators and um, connected light switches and light bulbs, those things are super low bandwidth, but require lots of transactions to turn off and on or notify you that you're out of milk or uh, that something's been removed from the refrigerator or that it needs service. So those, those IoT applications don't require tremendous amounts of bandwidth. So that's not going to be the driver for 400 gig. I think you touched on um, other types of AI, specifically virtual reality, um, the offshoots of virtual reality for, for self-driving cars or automated vehicles. Um, you know, let's not forget about the evolution of, of traditional entertainment. So from 1080p to 4K, now 8K content is being developed and no doubt in, in a year or two, you know, it'll be 12 or 16K and the consumer electronics world will continue to evolve with more advanced uh, entertainment options, whether it's gaming consoles or PC games or handheld gaming devices or uh, the newest self-driving car, you know, Elon Musk's next great invention that he'll wake up with in the middle of the night and, and create, you know, I, I don't think we even know what technology evolution beyond, you know, some of these basics. We, we see the current evolution of what AI looks like, but, um, you know, the, the Jetsons uh, might be closer than we think if, if, if you, you know, if I can date myself a little bit to that cartoon, but. <laughs> You know, having a Rosie rolling around the house, uh, serving coffee and and cleaning might might not be so far away. You know, we've we've got robotic vacuum cleaners now, and uh, those have evolved, um, and and no doubt they will continue to. Ray, your your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you look at um, John mentioned the number of transactions and things of that nature, and and you know they don't use a ton of bandwidth, but that's just going to impact, you know, some of the latency things on, on the network. But what we're really seeing is you know, a lot of the design around 5G networks, for example, calls for a lot of these applications that you mentioned. <clears throat> and that 5G bandwidth um, moving out to all the aggregation points on the network, it's, it's massive and compared to other access networks. I mean, they're not messing around, so to speak, with this initial rollout. You know, we're going to run 100 gig out to, um, you know, to a, a distribution unit. We're going 50 gig to this, you know, between the distribution unit and the central unit. I mean, there's all kinds of like crazy levels of bandwidth in the outside plant that you know, haven't really been talked about at this scale in a very, very long time, maybe in theory years and years ago, but now it's, you know, this is the design. And because of this design, it, it needs to aggregate back up. And, you know, I think that, you know, with the, push a lot of um, governments um, are putting on 5G networks. 
Yeah, that's going to drive a lot of the need for 5G, for 400 gig, regardless if they're using it or not. They're going to need it because of all these, of this massive pipes you're aggregating back to, um, to a central office or, or wire center. Okay, and um, be be before we finish, um, I, obviously we're talking to you guys from ProLab. So, what are you as a company doing right now in terms of 400G? And um, without giving away any sort of trade secrets, yeah, what, what what else is on the roadmap? Ray, do you want to talk a little bit about the product line, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll cover high level strategy after that? Yeah, absolutely. So, ProLabs is a you know full third party compatible um, transceiver company. So we're providing uh, 400 gig transceivers uh, in a tested environment for each of our customers that are compatible with the leading network equipment manufacturers on the market. So we're providing, we're from a, a short reach SR8 transceiver up through a, um, you know, a breakout DAC cable, 400 gig to 100 gig DAC cable and all the transceivers in between right now. So we like ourselves as a full service provider this, in this space. So. Right now, we're, we're really working with a lot of our customers who are in that notion of aggregating from 100 gig up to 400 gig. That really seems to be the sweet spot with this technology right now. And you know, we're happy to have the, the portfolio to help them get there. And I think to that extent, so, so Ray mentioned it, you know, we, we've launched a full suite of 400 gig transceivers and DACs and AOCs. You know, QSFP DD continues to be a huge focus and what lies beyond 400 gig. So, you know, we've already started road mapping with our, our engineering and operations team, what the 800 gig transceivers are going to look like. You know, the industry's already talking about what's beyond 800 gig, uh, despite uh, 800 gig not, not even existing in, in reality yet. Um, so, I, you know, I think ProLabs is absolutely focused on this business. You know, you look at network equipment manufacturers, transceivers are accessories for them. Um, at ProLabs, transceivers are our core business. Uh, it, it's what we do. We are the very best at it. Um, and it's our entire focus in terms of, of, of today's generation, uh, next generation, and, and supporting legacy platforms as well. So we're, we're very excited to have had this opportunity to, to interview with you and, and, uh, and share with you our thoughts on 400 gig and, and what lies beyond that. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, just, just sort of finally, finally, that you obviously reference 800. I mean, I, my background was in the storage industry. So, you know, it was fiber channel, one gig to two gig to four, you know, we never got to the giddy heights uh, yet, you know, to 400. But how, you know, useful and over what time frame do you anticipate sort of the 800 and presumably 1600 after that? Are we talking sort of decades or um, much sooner than that? I, I think we have some physics issues to to deal with as we talk about 800 gig and anything beyond that. So, you know, there are electrical physics issues with how you get um, data into a into a transceiver or into a laser for these these higher bit rates. And we talked a little bit about thermal challenges earlier with 400 gig, and those thermal challenges won't go away. In fact, they they just get amplified with 800 gig and beyond. So. Um, I, you know, my opinion is that we'll see 800 gig interfaces in the marketplace, um, maybe late 2021 or 2022. Um, you know, a lot of it will depend on the ability of technology partners to bounce back from pandemic. So I think, you know, this pandemic has, has not just affected service providers, but the research and development teams that are, that are out chasing these next generation silicon, next generation photonic technologies. So, you know, there's, there's been an industry setback that, that goes along with, you know, the, the quote unquote stop work or slow work that, that was accompanied with the pandemic. You know, Ray, I'd be interested, you disagree with those timelines? I, they might be a little aggressive, but mm -hmm. I, I'd be curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, you know, to John's point exactly. I think you'll see some early 800 gig, but that's going to be in, you know, certain cloud scale, hyperscale, you know, we build our own server type environments. I think you'll see that's where it'll be, but any type of um, scale, you know, that timeline of maybe late 2021, early 2022 will probably be where that, <clears throat> where that takes place. Um, from a you know a standard you know classical NEMS environment, um, but I think you know one of the things that you know John was mentioning about thermal issues. If you think about it, 
in a 400 gig transceiver or a 100 gig transceiver, you have four lasers. In an 800 gig transceiver, you're going to have eight lasers. So that's going to be a you know it's a lot of a lot of things to cool, a lot of things to to power up, and that just kind of uh, demonstrates some of the power or some of the the, the issues right that are going to have to over, be overcome. Okay, um, gentlemen, it's been great to listen to you. You've learned, well, I've certainly learned a lot about the, the 400G market, so thanks for that, and um, really appreciate your time. Thanks very much, Ray, and thanks, John. Thank, Thank you. you.